With daytime talk shows come all manner of topics, people, and the specific confrontations that these two things can bring. While many of them only result in mere arguments, onstage antics, or public meltdowns, some of them over the years have resulted in much darker outcomes. Before we get started, today's video is sponsored by AG1. AG1 is a daily foundation nutrition supplement that promotes whole body health. AG1 comes in this powder form that you then mix into the provided water bottle to get your drink. I tend to take one of these before I work out or go on a run. To me it tastes a lot like green tea, maybe a little bit sweetened. It's definitely refreshing. I feel that drinking it each day gives me a good burst of energy that I didn't feel before. I feel lighter, like I'm running clean. I'm more awake, alert, and I don't feel as sluggish throughout the day while writing my scripts. AG1 is a formula driven by science, containing vitamins, probiotics, and whole food sourced ingredients to support your gut, your immune system, and your brain. It combines what you would normally have to get from several other supplements into one, giving you a much more simple and effective way to support your daily performance and raise that baseline health up. Sometimes many vitamins and minerals out there are hard for the body to process. AG1 makes it easy by sourcing their ingredients for absorption carefully, really going for that potency and nutrition density, letting you get the most out of the nutrients you consume. Check out my special offer QR code on the bottom left of the screen to get a better look. So, go ahead and head to my link down in the description below to get yourself a free one-year supply of AG, Vitamin D3 plus K2, plus 5 AG1 travel packs with your first purchase of AG1. Give it a shot, I think you'll really like it. Trash TV was a huge phenomenon in the 1990s and 2000s. When people imagine these shows, they mainly think of shows like Jerry Springer, Maury Povich, and maybe something like Dr. Phil. There were a whole lot of these shows, though, and it wasn't only an American phenomenon. The act of watching people fight, argue, and expose each other on stage was something universally enjoyable, and the genre soon became inescapable. Predictably, though, bringing people on stage to make them fight and humiliate each other wasn't going to end well. It was a ticking time bomb. At some point, someone was going to get hurt or even killed, and that's exactly what happened, not too long after the phenomenon began. The first major crime to make international news coming from a trash TV daytime talk show was the murder of Scott Amador in 1995. When Scott brought Jonathan Schmitz, a straight man, onto the show to confess his feelings to him, the atmosphere quickly grew dark and awkward before, ultimately, Jonathan couldn't handle the humiliation and murdered Scott. We've covered that case in detail on this channel before, but that's not the only murder case to result from one of these talk shows. Far from it, actually. In fact, these cases would continue for years down the road. The next major crime to occur took place only two years after Scott's murder after a certain tell-all show in Spain. Ana Orantes Ruiz from Granada in Spain was born on February 6th in 1937. She had been married for quite some time, living with her husband and his parents. The problem is, she was a victim of domestic violence than had been since the very beginning of their marriage. The very first time her husband hit her was only shortly after their wedding. After he hit her, her father-in-law came running in upon hearing her screams. He hit his son in the face and scolded him for what he had done. Anna told her father that she had no idea why she had been hit in the first place. She felt guilty and apologized regardless, though. In response, her husband spit in her face. She had been hit in the face so hard that she felt most of the bones in her face must be broken. Little did she know, this was only the beginning of what was to come. It wasn't too long before her husband was beating her all the time, sometimes even daily. He would hit her, smash her into walls, pull her around the house by her hair, and more. He would hit her for things as trivial as moving a chair to a place he didn't like or placing a glass on the table incorrectly. Over a period of 40 years, Anna went to the police multiple times and told them what was going on. She hoped for a divorce, but it wasn't happening. In Spain and in much of Europe at the time, there wasn't a whole lot of protection for victims of domestic violence. There honestly just weren't that many laws in place that could help her out. 
In fact, it was only recently in 1981 that divorce had been legalized in the first place. She tried to leave as quickly as she could, but her husband managed to sweet-talk the judge into denying her request for a divorce. After years of fighting, she finally got what she wanted in 1996 and was allowed to divorce. The problem is, she had no means of supporting herself and nowhere to go. She continued to live with her husband, just on a different floor of the family home this time. This was recommended by the judge for the time being. This is where the daytime talk show comes in. Anna decided to appear on a television show called De Tarde and Tarde, also known as From Afternoon to Afternoon in English, that was broadcast by Canal Sur in Andalusia, Spain. She had to muster up a lot of courage to appear on the show in the first place, but it was something that she felt might help other people in her position. She was going to talk about her experience with domestic violence, saying that she hoped it would show other victims that they weren't alone. In particular, she wanted to speak to women who married very young and didn't know what they were getting themselves into. She spoke in grueling, graphic detail about how she suffered violence at the hand of her husband, Jose Parejo. She spoke of how she had met him at a festival in Granada when she was only 19 years old. Pretty early in their marriage, Jose left for his military service while Ana lived with her in-laws and started her new life. Things were going well for a while. The real problem started when Jose returned home. Jose began to keep Ana under very tight surveillance and the previously detailed violence began. This violence wasn't limited only to Anna, though, as the two began to have children. Anna's daughter, who was only 10 years old at the time, came to her mother and told her that her dad had been groping her thighs under the table while they were eating dinner. Anna came to her husband and confronted him. Jose responded by saying that his daughter made it all up, punching Anna in the face and then threatening her against filing a complaint. The couple had a few sons as well, and they complained of being hit by their father in the same manner. Anna recalled one instance when she took her 8-year-old son to the hospital for a medical emergency. She was out of the home for a while, as emergency rooms tend to take several hours on the best of days. When she came back home, she found all the blinds in the house closed and her husband waiting in the middle of the room for her, surrounded by her other kids. He asked her where she had been. When Anna told him, Jose beat her so severely that she felt she realistically might die. He accused her of making the rounds, sleeping with every man in the neighborhood, not actually going to the hospital. When the show finally ended, Anna was relieved that she had gotten her story out. The problem was, she had nowhere else to go but back home. Back to the home where Jose also lived. In their house in the village of Cudiar Vega in Andalusia, Jose Parejo was fuming. Feeling humiliated at seeing his dirty laundry aired on television, he was more angry than ever before. When Anna came home, he beat her severely and tied her to a chair. This was when he poured gasoline all over her and set her alight, burning her alive in their home while he watched in amusement. It took Anna's death and the resulting public outrage for any real change to be made. The public came out to protest at what had been a growing problem for years at this point with no real solutions. Even then, it still took quite a long time for anything to get done. In 2004, the government of Prime Minister José Luis Rodríguez Zabatero put a new law into place that would address gender violence. It was said that it was actually the most advanced in all of Europe. This new law would make sentences for offenders more strict and would make it much harder for them to contact their victims. They set up special courts specifically for cases of domestic violence and made it easier for women to report this abuse over the phone. José Parejo was caught and arrested shortly after the murder. After a trial, he was sentenced to a low 17 years in prison. He didn't even serve his full sentence, dying of a heart attack in 2004 at the age of 69. Only one month later, the new laws went into effect. Two years after Anna's murder, we had the case of Ralph Panitz. Ralph was a man from Germany who came to the United States and worked as a house painter. He loved women, but saying that he was dysfunctional in his relationships would be a vast understatement. He came to marry a woman named Nancy Campbell, soon getting a home together with her. The problem is, he started to cheat on her with a woman named Eleanor. It was a complicated love triangle fit for a soap opera. He divorced Nancy and moved in with Eleanor. He then married Eleanor in secret while still seeing Nancy on the side. The three went through months of cheating, domestic abuse allegations coming from all parties, and pure chaos. 
Ralph would bounce from his ex-wife's house to his current wife's house on the regular, breaking up with one to get back together with the other very often again and again. It came to be that none other than Jerry Springer would be airing an episode of his show that would discuss love triangles in May of 2000. In regular Jerry Springer fashion, different people would be brought on stage in order to argue for the entertainment of the audience. The title of this episode was Secret Mistresses Confronted, and it goes without saying that Ralph's dysfunctional three-way turd of a relationship would be a perfect fit for the show. They were brought on to discuss their little situation, and it went about as well as you would expect. At the time of filming, Ralph was with Eleanor and against Nancy. The two ganged up on Nancy, saying that she had been stalking and harassing them for months. Nancy said that this was ridiculous, revealing that they had all shared the same hotel room just the night before, demonstrating that they couldn't be on that bad of terms if that were really the case. So instead, Ralph and Eleanor began to ridicule Nancy, calling her fat and old, and even encouraging the audience to do so as well. Ralph had gone on the show in the first place to tell Eleanor, his new wife he met online, that he was still sleeping with Nancy. He said, I had sex with my ex-wife yesterday, but I did that to keep her illusioned. He then turned to Nancy and said, I care for you and don't wish you any harm. I just wanted you to know. Please let me go on with my life. Nancy, hearing for the first time that he and Eleanor had actually gotten married, dealt with the situation about as well as one could, to be fair, saying, That's fine. Bye. Before getting up and leaving. It was then revealed on the show that Ralph and Nancy had filed charges of domestic violence against each other over the years. After the show, Nancy went out to take a restraining order against Ralph. A judge formally banned Ralph from living in the home that he, from time to time, shared with her. Time passed, and the episode aired on July 24th. Only a few hours after the airing, all hell would break loose. Ralph confronted Nancy, choking her and strangling her. He had been infuriated at the restraining order that she had taken out against him after the show, taking insult in the fact that he wasn't allowed in her home. After the murder, Ralph Panitz went on the run. He attempted to escape to Canada, hoping to take refuge in the German embassy there. Ultimately though, in Maine, for reasons unknown, he handed himself over to the cops, about 2,000 miles from their home. Eleanor was also caught and held as a possible suspect and marital witness. Ralph ended up hiring a celebrity lawyer, Jeffrey Figer, who went on to call two forensic scientists who were used in the infamous O.J. Simpson case. This lawyer went on to tell the court that Nancy hadn't been murdered. Instead, he said that she had had a heart attack after getting into an argument with a friend over the phone. The prosecutors disagreed, saying that Ralph had been set off after being forbidden from living in his ex-wife's house. It was hard to find an unbiased jury, given that anyone might have heard of the show. After a 10-day trial, the prosecutors won. After the jurors presented their verdict, Jeffrey Figer actually blew up and insulted the jurors, saying that they made up evidence because none existed. However, 18 bloody footprints on the scene matched the shoe that Ralph owned and his DNA was found under Nancy's fingernails, so this was far from the truth. Ralph Panitz was found guilty of second-degree murder. He was also found guilty of violating his original restraining order. He knew that he was facing life in prison, and that's exactly what he got. During the sentencing, the judge came down on the Jerry Springer show for manipulating the parties involved. One of Nancy's sons, a man named Jeffrey Campbell, decided to sue the Jerry Springer show over his mother's death. However, given that a very similar case against another show had been thrown out just recently, he decided to drop the suit. A few years later, an arguably much more complicated case came about. This was the case of Melinda Duckett, a wife and the mother of a two-year-old boy out in Leesburg, Florida. To start at the beginning, Melinda was born and abandoned in South Korea but had moved to the United States in 1985 when she was only a few months old as she was adopted by an American family. She lived in New York until she was 17, after which she moved to Florida to live with her grandparents. There, she went to high school with a man named Joshua Duckett, a man who she would come to date. In her senior year of high school, Melinda ended up getting pregnant, giving birth shortly after graduation. She married Joshua in 2005, but as the two were a young couple, fresh out of high school, who hadn't even planned to get married before the surprise pregnancy, the marriage was anything but smooth. Most people around them described it as a tumultuous relationship. The two would go on to break up and get back together multiple times before finally getting a divorce in 2006. Joshua has said that Melinda was an extremely controlling partner to an obsessive degree. 
She was suffering from somewhat severe mental illness, even having been involuntarily committed in 2005 after she threatened to harm their son, Trenton. She was diagnosed with obsessive compulsive disorder at that time, but it was noted in her file that there was no psychological reason that she couldn't be a normal, loving parent. However, that very well may have been an incorrect assumption. On August 27th of 2006, Melinda and Joshua's son, Trenton, went missing. One of Melinda's friends had come over, and she was the one to call the police, handing the phone off to Melinda. Melinda then told the police that she went to check on Trenton after watching a movie with her friend, only to see that he was gone and there was a cut in the window screen above his crib. According to the police, she was unable to answer simple, routine questions asked by the dispatcher. Melinda quickly became the prime suspect in the child's disappearance. In fact, she was the only suspect. After all, she was the last person to see the child, and nobody else seemed to have any reason to take him. However, the police didn't arrest her and kept her around, hoping that she would eventually lead them to the boy. The problem is, there was no evidence in any direction. There was no explanation as to what had happened. If Melinda had killed him, why would she do it? When would she have done it that day? If she had given him to someone, who wouldn't know about it? If someone else had taken him, who would it be and why? Nobody had any answers. A surprise witness, a fast food worker of all people, came forward and said that she believed that Melinda had given Trenton to someone else. She said that she and the boy were at her Wendy's that very morning. This witness served the two and then saw them leave. About 20 minutes later, she saw Melinda come back alone. The police wondered if Trenton was possibly given away at that time, but they had no idea why. It was a theory that he may have been sent back to South Korea, as Melinda had recently become more interested in her roots, but she had no contacts within the country or any ties beyond that interest. Not only that, the whole thing didn't match up with the timeline at all. In the end, nobody had any theories that really made sense. Eventually, Melinda would agree to be interviewed about the disappearance on The Nancy Grace Show, interviewed by Nancy Grace herself on September 8th of 2006. While not necessarily being a trash TV show, this talk show would nevertheless end up with a dark outcome. Nancy, during the discussion, mainly closed in on Melinda, asking her difficult questions and urging her to take a polygraph test. When Melinda refused the test and provided only vague and basic answers to her questions, Nancy accused her of hiding something. Why aren't you telling us and giving us a clear picture where you were before your son was kidnapped? because I'm not going to put those kind of details out. Why? Because I was told not to. Miss Duckett, you're not telling us for a reason. What is the reason? You refuse to give him the simplest facts of where you were with your son before he went missing. The day after the show, Melinda sat down and wrote up a two-page letter addressed to the public. There, she wrote of her love for her son and her anger and humiliation after being exposed to what she called ridicule and criticism from the public. She put the letter on the dashboard of her car and entered her grandparents' home. There, she picked up her grandfather's shotgun, went into a closet, and shot herself. Melinda's family mainly blamed her death on the public scrutiny resulting from the Nancy Grace interview. They filed a wrongful death suit against her shortly after, accusing her of intentionally causing emotional distress. Nancy disagreed with this accusation, later saying, If anything, I would suggest that guilt made her end her life. To suggest that a 15 or 20 minute interview can cause someone to do that is focusing on the wrong thing. She said that, although she did sympathize with the family, she was well aware that the people in those situations will usually look for someone else to blame. I think it happened because Melinda Duckett may very well know where her son was. If anything, I would suggest guilt caused her to commit suicide. About a month before the trial was going to start, Nancy Grace reached a settlement with the family. She would create a $200,000 trust fund for the purpose of finding Trenton. If Trenton were to be found alive by the time he was 13, the remaining funds would be set aside and kept for him until he turned 18. If he was not found by then, the remaining money would be sent off to the National Center for Missing and Exploited Children. Unfortunately, Trenton has never been found. The Leesburg Police Department says that the case is still open and active. The most recent and really only update has been the National Center for Missing and Exploited Children and the Florida Department of Law Enforcement releasing an artist's depiction of what Trenton may look like today. His father, Joshua, still remains hopeful that his son is alive out there somewhere. The police, however, don't feel that this is so likely.
One year after Melinda Duckett's interview on The Nancy Grace Show came the story of Svetlana Orlova, a 30-year-old woman from Russia who had moved to Spain eight years prior. Svetlana was raising her two-year-old son by herself when she happened to meet a man named Ricardo Navarro. This relationship, although it started out nice, didn't stay that way at all. Ricardo had a violent side, once against a former partner that he began to show towards Svetlana as well. On one occasion, Ricardo broke into Svetlana's home, stole a number of her documents, and prevented her from leaving. She went to the police and reported him for that incident. After the violence escalated, Svetlana eventually went to the police and took out a restraining order against Ricardo, saying that she wanted nothing to do with him and especially didn't want him taking care of her young son. He came to be sentenced to 11 months in prison, but he was not expected to serve any time in jail. Instead, he simply was forbidden to contact Svetlana anymore. However, the police couldn't find him to actually serve him the restraining order, so he never knew about it and it never technically came into effect. Ricardo, unable to accept the fact that Svetlana wanted nothing to do with him, decided to contact the show, Diario de Patricia, Patricia's Diary in English, on the Antenna 3 channel. This show, much like any other talk show of this sort, would have themed episodes in which they would invite guests on to talk about their stories, argue, and the like. Ricardo wanted to be part of an episode that would feature surprise marriage proposals and asked that Svetlana be invited to join. Svetlana was invited on the show as the usual 2 million viewers watched from home, being told that she was going to be surprised by a relative from Russia coming out to see her that she hadn't been able to meet in quite some time. She happily agreed to go, not knowing that this would end up being the biggest mistake of her life. What was supposed to be a happy surprise for Svetlana soon turned out to be a case of instant regret. She sat down on stage, only to see none other than her ex-boyfriend Ricardo come out, the very man she had taken out a restraining order against. That man was violating that very order right then and there, she thought. Little did she know, he had never even received it. Ricardo lied to the host, Patricia, telling her that the couple's relationship had only ended due to financial struggles. Svetlana shook her head no in response. She realized that he was boldly lying to the host and the audience, saying herself that she had actually left because he was very jealous among many other things she didn't wish to get into. Nevertheless, nobody really knew quite how serious it was. The audience cheered as Ricardo got down on one knee in front of Svetlana and offered her a ring. They were shocked to see that he didn't get the answer he was looking for. In fact, the whole thing was quite awkward. Likely being the most uncomfortable she had ever been in her life, Svetlana simply said no in front of the whole audience and millions of people watching back home. Shocked and humiliated, Ricardo sat back down in his seat. Patricia told him that he needed to accept that love stories also end, and it seemed that he took that advice to heart on the surface. Deep down though, that was anything but true. Ricardo was nowhere near willing to accept defeat here. He decided that, as the cliché goes, if he couldn't have her, nobody would. He came up to her one day as she stood in the doorway of her home. There, he took out a knife and slit her throat as she stood. Then, it's said that he continued to stab her in the neck multiple times. Eventually, she was found and rushed to the hospital, but she was unable to survive the massive trauma and passed away there. Five days later, Ricardo Navarro was caught and charged with the murder of his ex-girlfriend. Even after his arrest and being by far the strongest suspect in the case, he denied any and all involvement in the crime. The TV show, Patricia's Diary, immediately went on to face public scrutiny shortly after the murder case became public. A spokesman for the show came out to give the public a statement in which they denied any responsibility for what had happened, saying, At the time, it appeared very romantic. We believe they had split up for financial reasons. He wasn't violent or tense, and neither was she. The law protects people's privacy and does not allow us to investigate their backgrounds. As we do in every case, we ask for information from the two people involved, and there was no indication from either side that there would be a problem. It was a complete surprise to us when we heard that she had been killed, as they left the show together. The producer of another show on the network, though, did let it slip that nobody had told Svetlana that she would be meeting Ricardo that day. Patricia's Diaries director said, what we do when there is conflict between couples is to pass a very specific questionnaire to both of them, in addition to the interview that the editor does, in which they are asked things like, if they have pending cases with the justice system, if they have been physically or psychologically abused by someone, if there is any restraining order against any person close to them, among others. She said no, there was nothing. 
It's likely that Svetlana merely felt that there was no need to mention Ricardo, as it seemed that he was gone, with the police even being unable to locate him, and she was there to meet a Russian relative, not him. Spain's Federation of Progressivist Women teamed up with some other women's groups in the country to file a court case against the TV station Antenna 3. They said, We believe that media professionals should be capable of assessing when a situation is delicate when treating women. A TV critic from the Chicago Times added, it's a surprise to many guests who go on these shows, and the producers know exactly what kind of explosive situations might evolve from this. A former TV executive who dealt with these sorts of programs in the past, Ted Cavanaugh, countered such claims, saying, We live in a culture in which we believe somehow people are not responsible for their actions. They are responsible. The police investigating Ricardo came to investigate the way these talk shows were run in general. At the time, the prosecutor stated that the humiliation suffered by Ricardo upon being rejected in front of a live audience was likely to be an influence on the crime to some degree. Just recently, many years after the murder took place, a criminologist was tasked with looking into Ricardo's personality traits. This criminologist said that Ricardo fits the archetype of a narcissist in the clinical sense, saying, after analyzing Ricardo's behavior, two profiles can be assigned to him, which could have triggered his decision to end Svetlana's life. People with this profile, when they feel humiliated, have their ego, self-esteem, and vision of themselves affected, which can generate this anger. Given their discomfort, the only way they can feel better is the desire to end it. With it being Svetlana's life. They added that a narcissist most likely wouldn't put themselves in that sort of situation if they weren't fairly sure that there was no chance of being humiliated, adding that there would have been an element of shock involved as well. They said, by taking her to television, he would think that she would say yes because of the pressure. It was another possibility that Ricardo was simply much more invested in gender roles than the average person, with the criminologist saying, People who have this mentality consider that, in a relationship, the man must be manly and the one who protects and cares for the woman. Consequently, he may have seen his masculinity damaged by receiving a negative response from her, which it could have also generated that need to end her life. That rejection would have altered his own vision as a man, and his solution would have been to kill the person guilty of making him feel that way, and whom he considers his possession. In conclusion, no matter which of these personality types Ricardo may have better fit, it was felt that the crime was one based on impulse. However, it would have taken a degree of premeditation within the five days between the filming of the show and the subsequent murder. Ending, they stated, after this analysis, it can be stated that having been rejected in front of millions of viewers would have been the trigger for Svetlana's murder. Finally, after a very long judicial process, Ricardo was sentenced to 21 years in prison for Svetlana's murder. Patricia's diary, having been on the air since 2001, would continue for eight more months after the murder before being cancelled among increasing public scrutiny on an international scale. As long as television shows of this variety continue to exist, there's always that possibility that one of them may cause something horrible to happen that may not have happened otherwise. It's safe to say that, without the added element of chaos and the humiliation that comes with airing one's private affairs in front of a national audience, many of the crimes we discuss today may not have happened. While some of the people on these shows come on with the best of intentions, such as Ana Orantes or Svetlana Ortega, many of them do not, only seeking to entrap, insult, and humiliate others live on air. While these programs have been decreasing in popularity over the years, it's only a matter of time before one of them leads to yet another case of murder. Once again, thank you for watching my video. If you enjoyed it, please give it a like, it really helps me out in the algorithm, and feel free to subscribe if you want to see more content like this. If you want, go ahead and follow me on social media, because if anything would ever happen to this channel, that would probably be the only way you'd ever hear about it. These same videos are now in podcast format as well, so feel free to head over to Spotify or any platform that you like and check them out there as well. I always appreciate when people follow me on Patreon, there's a link down there in the description. There you can get videos early, ad-free, and uncensored. Channel memberships are back up too and you can get the same benefits there as well. So, once again, thank you for watching. This has been your host, Kyle. Good night.